Arts of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur magazines, and if you love to paint landscapes, you'll have to learn how to do water and rocks really, really well. There's nobody better than Albert Handel. He's going to do that for you right now. The energy of the water could bring out uh, a rock without touching the rock. Uh, it's a study. Uh, where is the widest part of, uh, of it? Is it where it crashes down? Is it where it's falling down? Um, uh, is something stopping it and it's, and it's going this way instead of that way as part of it? it it's energy. It's, it's, it's movement. Um, when you put those uh, accents in, can you put your finger in there if you're a rock climber? Is the accent bigger and fatter? That means you can put your hand in there. So this is stable stuff. The water, I look at a lake as a bathtub. Water's coming in, water's going out, or that lake gets foul, period. So it's, um, and I like the, um, <laughs> The, the little ripples. Uh, okay, let's say it's a bit of a lake and uh, it's a blue sky and there's some blue going on there and there's these little ripples, do not make them blue. There's a different, I mean these are little, teeny little ripples. I go to purple, I go to something else. And if I stayed at blue, instead of it's light blue here, it's a little dark, it's boring. Uh, I like the way it funnels away from me, uh, the way it uh, finds its level, its crevice, uh, the way it um, nosedives down and slides down. And as it's sliding down, there's more reflection from the sky on the top of the slide as compared to the white of the energy as it goes down. And then, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, water falls apart. You know, if you have a high uh, enough waterfall, it's, it's cleansing itself. It's falling apart, it gets back together. Uh, it's interesting. Um, it's a body of water, you know, you can go into it. Uh, watch out, <laughs> it doesn't go into you because you go down. I just like the movement. Hi, you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to uh, demonstrate um, water, moving water, still water, reflections in water, uh, rocks underneath water. Speaking about rocks, they're surrounded by rocks. I'm going to be taking care of that also. You can't put everything into one painting. It it's, doesn't work that way. But what I'm going to do is extrapolate different aspects of what I'm going to be utilizing uh, as I uh, combine things. Working from photography is good as long as you're out there painting also. If you're out there just photographing things, um, I think you're missing out on options. 
of changing light conditions and options of color and usually your shadows will get way too dark and stay that way. When I first started painting, um, it was indoors and um, there was very few realistic painters then. You'd be surprised. It's a different world now. We had an understanding at the Art Students League of New York that if you worked from life, you were a fine artist and if you worked from a photograph, you were an illustrator. Now that notion went deep inside of a 19-year-old kid, and I don't agree with it, by the way. I think illustration is beautiful painting, and, uh, well, in any event. So for around 15 or 18 years, I would never dream of working from a photograph. And as my outdoor painting became more and more important to me, I, let's put it this way, I never did a portrait from a photograph, okay? But when it comes to outdoor painting, I think photography could be a good help. Uh, I felt very guilty uh, using photographs. It took me a while to get over that guilt. Uh, well, for example, when I was in Woodstock, New York, and I'd be painting that. And I'd turn around and say, oh my goodness, that's beautiful too. Uh, oh, 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 and the lights change, it's better. So uh, I was like a kid in a candy store. So I took a photography lesson, how to load a camera <laughs> and all that. They, they were all slides. Well, uh, the weather after a while gets miserable, and I only photographed that that I would have painted if I wasn't painting that, okay? It wasn't click, 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 click. No way. So uh, when the weather got uh, bad, you didn't want to go outdoors, I had these slides, and I put it onto a screen, and I was taken aback. I mean, they were beautiful. They were very exciting. And I started working from these slides. This is after 15, 18 years of never thinking of it. Well, it took a number of years for me to get over the guilt. You know, you're 19 and you're swallowing this nonsense. And... Um, and now I really like working outdoors. I do that with my pastels or watercolor underpainting, finishing with pastel. And I do that specifically for outdoors and I keep my oils for indoors, for smaller works and bigger works. It, it keeps me fresh, you know. I've been painting for God knows how many years and it keeps me fresh. And... Um, let me show you something about options, okay? I was painting this, see? There's my little blue truck. And I was very interested in the rock formation. And the rock formation looks lovely and had a blue sky. And 10 minutes later, it had a white sky. Just this alone changes everything and gives me insights as to what it could be or what I want it to be rather than I have to get it as exactly as it is, okay? So there's a flexibility for my using um, uh, photos. And anybody who works on location on plein air uh, a lot and takes photos, knows exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't done your plein air work, um, I, I suggest that you do. Okay, I'm going to show you a few things that I've done from photography. This painting came from this photograph. This painting came from this photograph. My photography kind of excites me 
and um, it opens up some inspiration or something. I'm not trying to copy the photograph. My paintings don't look like the photographs that I work from, yet without the photographs there's no painting. I, um, I'm interested in warm and cool. I'm going to take some burnt sienna, which is very warm. And I'm going to take some ultramarine blue, which is very cold, and kind of mix them together. Look how warm and cool that is. Now, when I mix them together, they'll be like a black. Notice when I want to go into the ultramarine blue, I use this brush. Notice when I want to go into the burnt sienna, I use this brush. And then all together. And like I say, this makes a very nice black, though I have nothing against black. I use black, especially in the woods interior. Maybe not if I'm painting an open field or something, but when you go in the woods interior, um, there's less light. Okay, I have this mixture. Now the question is, well, what do you have? Well, in order to find out what you have, you have to put white into it. So I'm gonna take some white, and you can hardly see it. When you can hardly see it, it's very close to the value of the palette. It's a little colder, but I'm going to make it a little darker. And I'm going to make it a little colder by putting in more ultramarine blue. And I'm going to take the one that I'm using for my mixture. And I have something like that. So I'll go to my white. And I'll go to my burnt sienna part, and I'll add some more burnt sienna in it. Look how rosy that is. Now I'm gonna put them near each other. and just show you how uh, warm and cool this mixture can make. There's the cool part. And now I'll use a little white in this. And there you go. See how it slips in and out of each other from warm to cool? In other words, this part right here can be blended with the greatest of ease. So that's why I like to use those two colors. I can go to this extreme or that extreme. I can even go further with the with the blue to practically, well, and you go further to the blue. Here you go. So I have this range with just these two colors. And um, 
That's like um, something I keep in the back of my mind for a little while. And uh, I'm going to show you about greens. A lot of people have problems with greens, and I can understand that. Let's take my viridian. It's a nice, dark, rich color. Let's take it away from there. And let's get some white into that. And you'll see that when I bring viridian up, it, uh, it's not really verdant. It's uh, like a, a greenish gray or something. Let's uh, get this up a little higher in value, a little darker. Yeah, I put that right next to this, and it's very close in value. Okay, so viridian and white gives me that. Now viridian and yellow, and there are different yellows, gives me this. So if I wish to work with a, a, a limited palette, so to speak, with four or five colors or whatever it is. I would have Viridian so I can have an off gray or I can have a nice warm yellow green. Now, these colors are all put on thickly and they will stay wet. And if that's what you want, that's what you do. But if I was starting a canvas, I would take any of these colors and I would uh, kind of thin it out. It's covering it. So a darker color, when you thin it out, gets lighter. I mean, I just thinned this out. I'll thin it out some more. So dark colors get lighter. And let's take white. I guess that's as bright as you can get. There it is. Now I thin out the white. And look how dark the white gets when it gets broken up like that. Look at that. So if I did this, and then I did that right on top of it, it's all white, but it's thinned out, and then it's opaquely applied. That can be a little tricky, but I'm showing you this because I manipulate the brush a lot when I paint. And um, just wanted to show you that. Also, I'd like to show you what happens to uh, Van Dyke Brown when I put white into it. It has such beautiful grays. Look at that, nice, warm. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Now, I do have some grays. And at one time, I would never have dreamed of buying a tube of premixed color. I mean, who does that? But uh, I have found I work out of a middle tone so much that a few of these premixed things actually helps me arrive at what I want to faster. I want to take this from the tube and put it right next to and on top of what I just mixed for you. So it's um, Van Dyke brown and white, and this has a little bit more yellow in it. I'm just wondering how dark 
is this middle tone gray. A middle tone gray more or less means it's halfway between white and black. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Uh, squint your eyes and uh, you'll see there is no edge. Um, here you go. So um, this is like a middle tone. It's 50-60% um, from white to black, let's say, uh, something like that. And a lot of my work is in that uh, value range. So um, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, when they uh, play roulette, you know, red, white, and black, or whatever it is, and they spin it around, and you get a, a mean uh, color, so to speak. You don't see them individually. And you can tell if your painting is dark or too dark, or too light, and stuff like that. So uh, I show you this because when I paint for you, I'm going to be talking about this, and I wanted you to see it uh, extracted from the painting. Now there's something I want to show you about application of color. I'm going to use one color, put it on one way, and then take the same color and put it on top of it. It's going to look like two different colors. So um, I'll take my brush. I'll go into uh, ultramarine blue and um, oh, anything. I'll take a uh, I'll take the Naples yellow again. Now for this, you have to have enough color in there. That's the color. Now what I'm going to do is thin out that color. So this darker color became lighter. Now I'm going to take some more of that same color that I just thinned out and put it right on top of it. And it should look like two different colors, but it's basically one by manipulating. Now, um, I tell my students uh, to clean the, especially in the underpainting, to clean the brush off uh, on the surface. Because you have to remember something. The nice thing about oils is that it's wet. And the problem with oils is that it's wet. So when I started painting, I want it to be as dry as I can get it and um, get going with the painting. So um, I use Gamsol. It's um, a, a substitute for turpentine. I, I don't like to put it on wet, so I scrub it on a lot. Uh, this should dry very quickly, very quickly, okay? And thusly, I can work on top of it, and I already have something towards where I'm going. There's a few things that I want to show you about water and rocks, reflections, seeing a rock underneath some water, and uh, how much of what I'm going to show you now I will be using in the painting, I don't know. You cannot get everything into the painting. For me, if I'm doing a painting and I have a lovely painting, but I don't have room for something else, the next painting, 
I do that something else and make sure I got it. Okay? Okay, like I said before, uh, you can't put everything into one painting. And there are some things I wish to show you, uh, like rocks under water. And um, what happens when you uh, go back onto a painting that was painted just the way I showed you with Gamsol? And um, I want to bring out the painting. So with that, I forget the Gamsol and I go to Winsor Newton Liquin and uh, Watch what happens. See how the docks had sunken in? See how vibrant the colors are? In the old days, this would be called a retouch varnish. And a retouch varnish is basically a varnish that's weakened with extra turpentine. Those are the old days. And um, this um, locks everything in. Once you, or once I put this on, it could work as a final varnish. It could work as a paint medium. And what I'm doing now, even though I'm going to paint in a small area, I'm bringing it all up to, um, not exactly snuff, but uh, up to uh, when it where it was wet. See the difference? So now, um, even though the docks will get stronger and you absolutely need that if I'm going to do anything, now when I go into this lighter area, which was initial suggestion of the water receding, I'm not too sure that's going to exactly stay like that. But even though it doesn't um, come up as much as darker colors, uh, in order to keep it unified, you just, in my opinion, have to cover everything with the liquid. So it's under... Um, So many a times uh, I uh, work on my paintings uh, more than once. Uh, I'm going to put uh, a rock here underwater. And uh, I'm going to use this gray. And I'm going to say it's in here. Now, uh, what I like to do is, if this is uh, relatively um, sharp, I like to soften the other side. So, um, everything is soft. And I do that. And I could leave it at that, or I can try and get some more out of it. I always like to try and get some more out of it. And I could do that very lightly. That's it. That's, you don't need much more.
and it's underwater. And then you can get uh, stronger here as it gets deeper. And uh, deeper. That will give you a nice idea. I want to take this thing out because I want to show you something else. Get a little stronger and keep the edges soft, but know where the edges are. Keep them soft because you're going through water. Okay, this is becoming underwater now. And um, uh, let's take that out. I don't need this dark thing. So when I take something out, I say to myself, I don't need this. Um, I take it out on a two-step. In other words, uh, that had to go, and maybe some of it could stay, uh, rather than get uh, frantic and uh, just take it completely out. Now, what I want to show you is another thing about these rocks. Again, it's under, good. Very soft, and I'm going to put all this under. Now, remember I told you I vary the pressure with the brush, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm not obliterating anything. I'm just taking it down so it goes underneath something, the water. So... Um, I mean, this is going on, I mean, like that, okay? So, um, it's varying the pressure with the brush and um, kind of like keeping what was there, yet uh, it's played down, I think that's the word. So, let's play all this down. And let's uh, go around to this here rock, which is poking out of the water. Uh, uh, I don't need this one like that. I'd like to play that down. And as I play it down, um, it goes under the water. See? Now, um, a nice thing to do with, with rocks underwater is to have part of the rock above the water. That's what I'm trying to do for you right here. See? Um, again, um, Manipulating the brush, see? Okay, I'm gonna put a lot of this stuff even more underwater. Um, when I do that, this stuff really stands out. And uh, And this is what I had started up here. And I'm going to do a little bit more with that. And as I go away, the, the green, um, well, let's see how it goes. Let's put another rock underwater. Let's, um, let's uh, put like a ledge underwater. So now, 
when I started this, I put in everything as I wanted. And now that I'm uh, using this, I'm going to put a ledge underneath there. Again, you're starting to sense it. Uh, this is um, too much of an area. It, it has to spread out. So I'm going over these light uh, uh, things. And uh, that uh, starting to feel wetter. And now I will uh, taper off. Okay, um, I'll take that and push it a little bit more. Don't be afraid to push things a little bit more. If worse comes to worse, you just take out what you pushed a little bit more. And that's starting to feel really good to me. And I'm wondering if I couldn't leave that alone and... Um, get a suggestion by working around it. That feels wonderful. Now let's see what happens when I go over this part a little bit more. Let's see what happens to um, that. I like that. Let's go up a little higher, even up to there. Yeah, let's do that. And um, yeah, that's underwater. There you go. How are them apples? Just pushing it a touch more to see if I can get a little bit more out of rocks under water. And I hope this is helping you. I mean, it's, it's delicate. I take nothing for granted. Nice. Um, a little bit more green up here. And since it's uh, getting a little bit too green for my blood, I'm going to take... Uh, a little bit of blue and just put it in. And I might just take um, a little bit of, if it's uh, too green, uh, the thing that straightens that out is a little bit of a reddish color, but it has to be exact same value. Okay. Actually, it's a little darker and I like it. So now if I was in my studio, I would be painting on this one for quite some time. Um, I want to see if I can get that underwater still a little bit more. So uh, again, I want you to see what kind of a brush stroke I'm making. Uh, you, 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 can, you can see the results there, but um, for learning, um, it's like that. That is changing that. So um, it takes very little. And uh, look what that does. And this is now above water, and uh, l let's soften all of this. 
And the more I saw, I, I, yeah, let's do that. And mind you, I'm going to make this stroke one more time. That's all I'm doing. Trust me on that, please. And look what it does to this. You don't have to turn the picture upside down and backwards. Uh, I like to modify things. Um, in other words, this is good, except uh, I want to get it underwater more. So I'll take what I have, and certainly I'll add anything I have to, but I'll take what I have and I'll modify what I have and see how that goes. And um, it's... Uh, and uh, if I'm using any um, medium, it's the liquid. And I'm using it very slightly. At first, you saw that it was matte, and I had to put the liquid in uh, all over. And uh, yeah, as this goes underwater more, the other stuff, um, Contrast, let's see, let me, let me go on like this. Let's see what's happening here. Okay, that's too far away from that uh, green. So I'll put some in. I'll put some in. And kill the reddish brown. Okay, okay. It's underwater, it's underwater. Okay, uh, I painted this while waiting to come here and demonstrate for you. I've been here a couple of weeks. And notice I'm taking my hand on the white. The slowest drying colors that I'm aware of is white and yellow. And yellow means green, especially a light green. Again, this, has, this is an Alla Prima painting. And um, uh, I have to bring everything up. And I want to talk to you about reflections in this one. So I'm taking this and watch what happens when I put this on. Look how it has sunken in. So the darks sink in more so than the lights. So before I can do anything on this painting, to show anything, I have to bring it up to the way it was when it was wet. Now, when this dries, um, there should be no sinking in of these colors or a little bit. It, it depends. And... Um, look at that difference. See, I really couldn't um, judge my colors, which are fresh and vibrant like this is, when it was sunken in, as simple as that. And there's a few things I want to show you, which has to do with water and rocks. And one of them is going to be reflections. Now, when I painted this, I had no idea I was going to do ref uh, reflections. So the white water is there, and uh, we have to build a ledge right here. And um, that separates things. And there could be a little bit of uh, 
water coming in here. I would uh, take this out. Play it down. Play it down. Play it down. Okay. So with this like that, um, with this like that, uh, I want to have that ledge. So I will take that, some white, and just uh, do a little bit more of that. So there's more of a ledge. Okay. Now, what's up here goes down here. But again, work very, very lightly, like I showed you before. Very lightly, if it gets a little bit better, be very thankful. I'm not too sure I need that the way it is. So I'll incorporate it if I can. And uh, just remember the reflections reflects that, but it's very soft. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's as uh, strong as uh, thing itself, but in general, in general, I would say, see if it's, and make sure this stuff is laying down. Okay, now this comes here, and it's going on an angle back. Just do that. Nice. Come out a little bit stronger. So there's a lot of uh, subtle, gentle painting going on with these reflections. Now, uh, usually on a sunny day, uh, there's usually a blue sky, and every so often, you can get a sense of the blue sky. Let's see how that will work, if it, if it will work. Sometimes um, this adds to the picture, sometimes it could take it away from the picture, but it's good to push it and see if you can't get it. I like that. Um, Okay. The 
this will give you a good idea about reflections. I tell you what, let's put a, a rock under water. Or a whole area under water. Slowly but surely. And uh, nothing is sacred. When I want to put a rock under water, I focus in on that completely. And let's see if that will work for this. I'm going to try and get some blue into that. It works, but it's very subtle. Let's make that a little richer and darker. Okay. So what I showed you before, okay, that might be a little bit too green. So I'll put some of this into it so it's not so green. A little echo of it. And then this part can come right on top of it. And um, we can do a few things. That one brush stroke, uh, I like it. Very lightly, very lightly, very lightly. So varying the pressure of the brush, which I extrapolated before, uh, is precisely what I'm doing. And the reason why I extrapolated it is so that you can realize that I'm using that right now. And um, a lot of artists don't realize that um, they can vary the pressure of the brush stroke and really get some very nice results. Yeah, there you go. I might just take that little bit out and put uh, something that resembles the rock above it. Let's see what that will do. Yeah, I think it's better for the for what we're showing you at this time. Okay. Water has energy and uh let's take this painting and uh okay. We have a, a waterfalls The water creeps through little cracks. Nothing stops it. Nothing stops it. When it hits a high point, um, it breaks apart and comes back together again. Um, when it has so much energy, um, it supersedes just about everything. And here is... Uh, a ledge, and um, when I think of the energy of the water, I just uh, know I, it can't be stopped. So here we have that, and um, uh, 
At times it gets a little brighter and it comes down into here. Okay, I'm going to have this coming like this and having it come down. And um, uh, what I will do to justify that a little bit is um, uh, make believe it's some kind of a rock back there or something. Okay. That feels better to me. One of the reasons why I like to play, paint uh, this subject matter is because I admire the energy of the water. Water is very interesting. Uh, it's a body that you can enter. Also, um, it uh, falls apart and gets back together again. Uh, that's what's happening uh, here. And, uh, okay, good. I get a little higher. That'll make more sense. Okay. And, um, I like these little drips. Now there's a crashing on of, of, of this. Um, uh, it's going around a rock. The energy of the water. Uh, Uh, I want more. I want more. When you want to show the energy of the water, just don't contain it. Just don't contain it. Just don't contain it. Again, I'm varying the pressure of that brush. I don't want it to be white water. I want it to be water that's kind of sliding off a rock. So vary the pressure. This is good. And uh, bring, bring it in sometimes. Water seeks its level. And uh, keeping that in mind might help you with getting the energy of the water. So you've seen how I've taken a picture where the energy of the water was not foremost and I changed it into that by just uh, going with the flow. <laughs> that sounds strange, but go with the flow. Lighten it, uh, strengthen it. Um, 
this uh, will be better if it um, wasn't so linear and it was more of that. Same with this. Now when you get down here, you're going to have to uh, delineate certain things. As you delineate the certain things, as it moves, you are um, exposing, uh, there you go. And uh, anything that impedes the water Again, uh, I showed you how I manipulate the brush. And uh, sometimes just the opposite thing will help this. This might be a little bit too green, but let's see. Let's try it out. It's a little darker. Okay, what, everything I'm doing here now is not trying to uh, finish a painting or anything like that. Everything I'm doing now is to show the energy of the water, period. That's, that's why I'm doing anything here. So, uh, okay. That's good. And now I like to take my knife something about the knife that's just wild and uh, succulent uh, you can make a okay come on there you go there you go Okay, when you come down here, come on down. Come on down. Okay, when you're here, uh, it goes every which way. You know, there's an old saying, it doesn't hold water. It's hard to hold water, even on these dams. They have to let some of it out. Okay. What I'm doing now is, um, let's see. I think I'll take that down also. So I'm going to do, uh, uh, instead of with a knife, I'm going to do it with a brush, and I'm going to do it gently. Because it might be fine if it was played down. I don't know. You have to... Uh, These things crash into each other. Now, when water moves around like this, it kicks up a little bit. So the bottom part of this rock, uh, you could see it, but it's not as, it, if you make it very dark, um, you'll lose the movement of the water. So everything I'm doing now is so that the water moves. And uh, I don't want you to think of anything else. That's the whole job here is that, and whatever has to go, goes. So notice how when I lighten this up, and you can see, it, this is some kind of a scumble or something, like I tried to show you, where you use a lighter thing, white, 
and you use it very lightly, and the thing that's underneath it, the, the rocks, still are there, okay? Wonderful, wonderful. I'm delighted that I'm showing this. Okay, that helps with the water being as wild as it is. And uh, okay. Wonderful. And the water could be banging up against this rock a little bit, like that, going over it, floating over it. Um, this looks like a crisscross or something, so let's get rid of that. And, uh, okay, if we want that rock to um, stand out, we just go with this. And um, 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 Okay, come on down and bring this further up. And uh, do one more thing. Um, this shape uh, is uh, a little bit too round, so I'm going to take it down a bit. Okay. I think it shows it, doesn't it? Okay, talking about the energy of water, white water. Uh, in the summertime, when you go out into the woods, the white water stands out from everything. You go out there in the winter and there's some white snow floating around, and this looks dirty. Uh, it doesn't stand out at all. It looks like filthy white water <laughs> compared to the snow. You go out there in April, May, early June, and you'll have a torrent. You go back out here in August and September, and it'll be like it was before. Uh, in other words, I switched um, the I showed you the energy of the water as if it was April, and before this painting uh, had it quieter as if it was September or something. There's no uh, Z in this alphabet. Uh, I know, I wish there was a Z, so when you get to Z, you know it's done and that's the end of it, but there's no, for me, there's no Z in this alphabet. And um, it's when I decide to stop painting on it, that's, that's it. Uh, but there are so many variables that you can have and it's so um, inviting. I like that. What's that? Okay. We'll just uh, soften that. Uh, as I soften this, this is important. As I soften this, there's more energy to the to the water. Uh, every so often, you you want a a, a shot, a, a contrast. Otherwise. Um, Remember, it kicks up a lot. What I do, uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. I have a few favorite subjects in rocks and water. And 
not the ocean, but um, mountain streams. There's a big difference. And um, we're not dealing with the ocean. We're dealing with mountain streams. There's a certain amount of repetition that one can sense in a mountain stream because the water is just moving along, finding its level, while the ocean is heaving up and down and moving forward and back. But um, uh, there's uh, that uh, finding its um, uh, level, so to speak, there is a repetition. If you stay there and think of it as uh, movement, uh, movement, rhythm, same word, um, you can actually study it. What I did at one time, <laughs> uh, when I lived in Woodstock, New York, I went to this wonderful restaurant that had terrible service. And I sat up there and I could look down in the stream. And I brought pad and pencil. I was drawing the movement of the water. And I was very, it was a nice um, uh, pencil where I can get light lines and darker lines. And if you are really interested in painting it, uh, I found drawing it um, very helpful. I should show you the different types of canvases I work on. I personally like to switch around from a white ground. Now on a white ground, you get colors immediately. And uh, as you develop the painting, you're going to have to realize that the colors are so exciting that you're going to have to get contrast. You're going to be shooting for contrast, okay? When I work on a gray ground, and notice this gray is not terribly dark, the contrast is immediate. The whole thing is to get the color, okay? So it's um, two attitudes, okay? I'll be showing you one of them but in, in, the, in the painting demo, but I just want you to know this. That is a big difference. And if you're new to this, uh, uh, figure out which way the composition works best for you. If you're new to this, I recommend a gray. I really do. Uh, a light gray. And with the grays, you have a choice of an opaque gray like this is. And this was painted with uh, gesso, gesso white. And I used some raw umber, and it was so pink, I put a little green into it. It's just too pink, but it's opaque. Now, here's this. If you're starting out, you have a palette that's gray and you have a surface that's gray. And believe me, that can help you. Now, here's my thought. I, I have too many students who are making all sorts of uh, experiments. Figure out which experiment works best for you and stay with it. Stay with it until you're bored. In other words, what I'm suggesting to you, if you have a gray palette like this, use a gray background like that. Then uh, blue will look like blue. You know, there won't be any transition from a dark palette or this and that. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is draw with a brush. That means uh, no color and a dark gray or a dark brown. I have Van Dyke brown. Um, the underpainting, drawing with a brush. I'm going to come up higher so I can have more room for water. Come down like this and the water is going to come like this and I'm going to have plenty of room in here for whatever I have to do. And uh, still I have plenty of room up here. So um, still drawing with a brush. In other words, no concern whatsoever for color. And uh, I'm saying, well, this is pretty good. Let's get a little bit more. And let's get the base of this and go all the way out. And uh, there's a, 
I guess there's a major rock right here. And um, I guess this will be my center of interest. And I'm doing this. And I'm taking the entire shape of the water, the entire shape, as if it was um, a white rock or something, just the entire shape. And I'm coming down here so that this is shorter and this is longer, okay? So, um, drawing with the brush a little bit more, I come out to here and I do this. And now I'm just going to go right into multi dark colors, a little bluer. And I'm going to scrub it on, like I showed you. And uh, go like that. Now this thing goes right across, so they shouldn't be all that separate from each other, you know. These things break away from each other. All right. Now what I have here is a bunch of um, a forest back there. So I'll just get up here and uh, just do that and uh, go like that for the time being. And uh, what I'm going to do with these rocks is um, get them nice and light on the top and darker as I go down. I put this on and I say, I can hardly see it, so it's the same value. I um, take this color and I put it on and I can't see it. So that means it's exactly the same value because there's no edge. So if there's no edge and it's a cooler color underneath it, I can kind of scrub it on and make use of the base. Uh, as I go down the area, I'll get a bit darker and maybe a bit colder. We'll see how this goes. It's going very nicely. So I go like this and I take it out. Then I put this color right into that so it's a intermediate. There you go. So I see already that the top part's going to be lighter and the bottom part's going to be darker. And um, darker and richer in color, I'll take a little bit of viridian. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a little bit of this reddish color and put it in here and scrub it on. Like I told you before. I uh, always look at it, this is personal, as one step closer to where I'm going. And uh, see how I'm spreading this out. You're gonna see how it dries very, very quickly. Okay, I'll take some of that and I'll put it right in here. So it'll go from a, a, a mutual to a reddish color. And this I'm scrubbing on and it's part of the underpainting. And I want it to be transparent and I want it to dry quickly. In order to do that, I do not wet the paint that much. I scrub it on. And I'm going to take something totally different so it becomes a nuance. Anything that's part of the underpainting shouldn't have uh, very sharp edges, especially uh, if it's um, part of, a, let's say, a rock face, what this is. And I go like that. And I like the colors, 
that are happening here. Um, I think I can make that a little darker. Good. Very good. Get it a little bluer. And I think I'll get it a little darker. I'm putting my brush into ultramarine blue and I'm spreading it out. Ultramarine blue is a dark color, as you know. And as I spread these things out, they get lighter. Oh, I feel very good about this. Now, um, at this moment, we're gonna have woods back there with a lot of green. So I will use anything but green. And uh, uh, I wanna get right up to that. And this part doesn't matter. It's this um, line which is so contrasting. And that contrast I always have to keep. And I'm doing that like that. And then I'm gonna take some more blue right out of the tube, so to speak, and scrub it on. Notice how dry it all is. Very little dripping. So I have some warm reds and I have some cool blues there. It feels very good. Um, <clears throat> I'll come down to this and uh, do some more of that. I think I'll keep the warm color going and I'll have it go right past this. And that's very warm now. And um, hmm, I like it. And I'll take some blue now. This is going to be much wetter and cleaner. Cleaner means you can see the blue easier. And like I say, clean the brush off. You don't have to pile a lot of paint on right now. Okay, and uh, that's good, all right. Now, uh, I want uh, the top part of my rocks to be lighter. And I know that this color is very close to the value of what's going on here. And what I wanna do is just, uh, uh, just, uh, drift over things, it's okay. Now, okay, this is feeling very good. I wanna clean this off. And um, in the water, there's a certain amount of green, and it's darker, and that's uh, too green. So I'm going to Put some blue into it. That feels better. And uh, soften the edges, soften the edges. Okay, so far so good. Uh, I'll take the green, which is too much, and I'll cut across here. Enough room for all sorts of things, good. Uh, I'll take some gray. This gray is too light, so I'll make it a little darker. Okay, let's see what we have here. Good. So this is basically the underpainting part, 
and um, I'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm taking the viridian and the burnt sienna. I'm coming up with something like that. I just want to get it darker here, much darker here. Okay, a little bit more of this and scrub it into it. So my underpainting, I want it to be transparent and I want it to dry quickly, very simple. Anything that doesn't do that does not work for me for the underpainting. Okay. Now, let's just dirty this up a little bit. I'm not too sure what I want there, but I want to get rid of um, the gesso. Um, very thinly. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just imagine what could happen with your art when you study with a master artist who's been drawing and painting for over 75 years. Albert Handel is one of today's most successful artists with over 70 major awards and prizes and over 30 one-man shows to his credit. It's a rare and wonderful opportunity to learn from such a talented and accomplished artist. His warm, reassuring manner will rivet your attention to every word and every stroke. Uh, I'm going to show you a lot of things about a mountain stream. The movement of water, the falling of water, the uh, reflections within water, and of course the water is surrounded by uh, boulders and rocks and rock faces, and I'll get into that. Now, with painting water and rocks in oil, Albert will show you how to take what touches you in nature and translate your impressions with paint. Water is one of the most challenging subjects for many landscape painters. Albert demonstrates his techniques for bringing realistic flowing waters into your paintings with ease. And if I stayed at blue, instead of it's light blue here, it's a little dark, it's boring. Uh, I like the way it funnels away from me, the way it uh, finds its level, its crevice. It, you know, water falls apart, you know, if you have a high... Uh, enough waterfall, it's, it's cleansing itself, it's falling apart, it gets back together. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I just like the movement. You'll also gain a thorough understanding of painting rocks, the color, and the lost and found edges that make the rocks come alive. Look at that difference. See, I really couldn't um, judge my colors, which are fresh, and vibrant like this is when it was sunken in. As simple as that. You'll be more confident with rocks, whether you're painting them as a center of interest, a strong backdrop, or as a way to direct the water. Albert covers it all here. Uh, overlapping. 
is big. So there's two things I'm pointing out now that I didn't point out before, and that is lost and found edges and overlapping. Albert covers it all here, from toning the canvas all the way to adding final touches. You can paint right along with him as he explains his decisions and methods, which have resulted in the signature look that has brought him recognition and respect throughout the decades. Well, I hope I inspire my students that they want to study with me because they looked at my paintings and they say, God, that's good, that's beautiful, I'd like to learn that. Available on DVD or digital to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy of Painting Water and Rocks in Oil with Albert Handel today. That was painting water and rocks with the legend Albert Handel. And you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's learn more about Albert. We've got a great interview with him. When did I start painting? In a sense, the word always. I mean, when I was uh, five years old, uh, one of my aunts brought me a coloring book and I loved it. Uh, I went and saw a Walt Disney uh, cartoon or something where it's a blank screen and the brush went like this and paint went down and turned into a, a, a scene, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, I was always taken in visually and um, I was overly protected also at the same time. And uh, in other words, they were always feeling me to see if I was sweating or something. And uh, roller skating was dangerous and this, that, and the other thing. And I liked to draw and they encouraged us. <laughs> it was safe. And uh, from uh, at the corner there was a luncheonette. And for a nickel, I could buy three, four pieces of, uh, or two cents, I could buy uh, three pieces of white chalk. So I started drawing, and I, I liked it. And they told me I was an artist, and I needed that. But I just uh, was drawing. Back then, we still had an ice man that came with a horse and a, and a wagon. And I did a little Sutton or other where he was down the block and all that. And uh, I was told, gee, that's special and all that. And then um, for a nickel, I could buy three colors or something. And I was in seventh heaven. I just drew and drew and drew. And they kept telling me, you're an artist, you're an artist. And I, and I just kept drawing. It was safe. And it was something I liked to do. So I did it. When I was in elementary school, it was Santa Claus or something. I drew the Santa Claus. They asked me to do it. I, I guess the word was out. If anybody's going to do a Santa Claus, it was me. So they called me. I did that. And then there was, um, I always liked doing it. I liked jigsaw puzzles because the shapes could fit in. I, um, I could match the colors. Um, so um, they took me to Pratt, uh, Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn. You've heard of Pratt. Well, they had Saturday classes, so I went there and I loved it. And then, uh, I mean, they took me, you know, I'm eight, nine, ten, uh, to the Brooklyn Museum where they had classes and drawing. Uh, they had an Egyptian floor or something. And uh, I was encouraged and encouraged and junior. And uh, in junior high school, I found myself, instead of playing rough tackle, uh, doing uh, what, what, uh, tempera. And then, um, uh, well, high school, what about high school? So um, uh, I went and tried out for the High School of Industrial Arts. And they had a model standing up there, and we were all drawing. And I looked around, and I thought my drawing was as good as anybody's. So when I came home, I said, well, I think I passed. And then they were overly concerned about things and all that. And a cousin of mine taught piano at Music and Art, which is a totally different high school. Uh, there you go to college. 
In industrial art, you go out and work. You know, you go to Madison Avenue. So they heard from that distant relative that hey, he won't make it. And I came home. I said, I'm in. I mean, and I was in. And um, then um, in high school, I was, I, I was so good until I realized they weren't teaching me to paint. It was lettering and whatever else. So one of my teachers said, if, if you like this stuff, go to the Art Students League. They have a sketch class from four to six or whatever it was. And uh, the Industrial Arts was in Manhattan. I lived in Brooklyn. I went to Art Students League and it was fish going into water. And it started at 16. Before that, it was kind of like a dream. I don't know what I did, and it's fine, whatever I did. But once I walked into that Art Students League, and I smelled the turpentine, and I saw the old, it, it, it was built by architects for architects and artists uh, in 1890, whenever it was. I just loved it. And then again, I was going to see my first nude. I was, and then uh, this lady walked in, went behind the screen, came out with a bathrobe, got on the stand, took off her clothes. No big deal. So I was drawing, and I, on the breaks, I looked at the other people's drawings. They were better than mine. And I didn't like that. I was excited, though. I, I had mixed feelings. I wanted to be good like them, and I didn't like the idea they were better than me. And so they said, oh, kid, uh, on Saturdays, we, so I started going there on Saturdays, and my life changes. I always wanted to be a realistic artist. I always found composing the painting far more exciting than finishing the painting. It's as if it was more creative for me. I found getting into all that detail nice and tedious. It wasn't the thrill like starting it. I consider myself a realist with abstract, uh, ben, an abstract bend to it uh, or a strong design. Uh, I'm a realist. Now, there are some groups that I'm too abstract for. And I'm not abstract enough for other groups, right? So I'm somewhere. Uh, I, I can't uh, nail it down. Uh, back then, um, in New York City at the Art Students League, if you worked from a photo, you're an illustrator. And if you worked from life, you're a fine artist. And I wanted to be a fine artist, so at 19 or 20, uh, this uh, notion went uh, deep. And I've always worked indoors and outdoors uh, from life. I, uh, I've done a lot of portrait work. I um, tried two or three uh, commissions, and I hated them. And yet I loved doing the portrait, and I, I wouldn't say I did character studies. Maybe if there was a... I don't know, there was, I did people who I wanted to paint. And um, um, I, a still life, it means setting it up. I had trouble setting up the still life, but doing part of a room, which is a different kind of still life, you know, nothing's moving, uh, that I could do with ease. Um, dishes in the, as they're sitting there drying with the pots and the pen. that I could take that and move it and paint that. It, to me, that was more natural, uh, but um, I don't know. Uh, I couldn't really set up still lifes, but I could do interiors, I could do the portrait, and I could do the figure. Now, with the portrait, uh, under North Light at the Art Students League, I stood further back 
where I could see the light or uh, light yellowish color of the forehead because the bone is close to it. And then I'd go down here and here it'd get redder. I did not work from photographs at all until uh, I was in San Miguel de Allende and I was doing marketplaces. Now I like doing marketplaces. I grew up with push carts and um, stores with uh, vegetable stands and all, all that. And I thought uh, the, the marketplace in San Miguel de Allende was incredible. So I did learn something about black and white photos. I eventually go into Woodstock, New York in 1970, okay? And I'm painting on location with oils, and I start a little later with pastels. Um, and pastels is not really uh, an en plein air medium, you know. And, uh, I'm standing there, and I'm painting this, and I take a break, and I say, oh, oh. And, um, oh, oh, and uh, what I decided to do with slides was take photographs only of what I would have painted if I wasn't painting that. I was like a kid in a candy store. Well, the weather can get, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, not for outdoors, okay? So I was indoors, and I looked at these slides that I would have painted. They're not just slides. They're slides specifically of what I would have painted if I wasn't painting that. And it hit me. It was like being out there. Uh, it wasn't black and white now. This is uh, slides. Well, with trepidation, I figured, well, if I'm going to paint a landscape and I can't go outside, well, I did a nice painting. I felt very guilty, very guilty. Uh, the weather was terrible for a few weeks and there was another image that just hit me and I was able to paint them. I was able to paint them, but I had this guilt from a kid, you know? When somebody comes to the studio and I have a painting on the easel and they say, oh, how nice. I say, oh, okay. And they say, where did you paint it? I say, well, I have a monitor now. I say, I painted from the monitor. And I put on the image. And they say, you painted that from that? I say, yeah. It's a funny thing. The painting it doesn't look like the photograph. But without the photograph, there's no painting. So what's going on? I sometimes have to wonder. I think I'm inspired by, I have a lot of familiarity from one work after the other work after the other work. Uh, uh, it's not that I just do mountain streams. Uh, you know, I have around three or four special subjects. Uh, I love trees. I happen to like adobe where I live. It's very alive and uh, it, it's uh, open as compared to back east, which was like closed in. And I like the greens uh, as compared to the adobe. It's a whole different story. Well, here's how it goes with me. Let's talk about landscape again. Uh, one, I don't like to drive for three hours looking for something. I live in Santa Fe, if I'm going to paint in towels, I sleep in towels, I don't drive to towels, okay, because I'll get exhausted visually. Um, so let's say where I'm living, the studio and the subject is 10, 15 minutes away and it's a notion of a pond or a waterfall, and I get out of the car with nothing, and I walk, and if something hits me, that's it. Because as far as I'm concerned, my eyes are open all the time. You know, I don't walk around like, that. you know, they're open. But if something hits me, to me, it says to me that something out there is touching something inside. 
and my job is to figure it out with paint. So anything could inspire me. And you're just walking from the car into this place here. You have a rock face to the left. Uh, I could have painted that. <laughs> Things that hit me uh, inspire me, and I don't have any rules about it. I like my work to hit them. Uh, if it doesn't hit them, they don't have to bother. But if it hits them, I want them to realize it's an emotional exchange that uh, I got involved with something with paint that really hit me that I had to do. And uh, it's good quality, beautiful color. Um, uh, there's weight to it. Uh, there's atmosphere to it. There's beauty to it. That was from painting Water and Rocks with Albert Handel, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes, and thank you for watching. Just imagine what could happen with your art when you study with a master artist who's been drawing and painting for over 75 years. Albert Handel is one of today's most successful artists with over 70 major awards and prizes and over 30 one-man shows to his credit. It's a rare and wonderful opportunity to learn from such a talented and accomplished artist. His warm, reassuring manner will rivet your attention to every word and every stroke. Uh, I'm going to show you a lot of things about a mountain stream. The movement of water, the falling of water, the uh, reflections within water and of course the water is surrounded by uh, boulders and rocks and rock faces and I'll get into that. Now with painting water and rocks in oil Albert will show you how to take what touches you in nature and translate your impressions with paint. Water is one of the most challenging subjects for many landscape painters 
Albert demonstrates his techniques for bringing realistic flowing waters into your paintings with ease. And if I stayed at blue instead of its light blue here, it's a little dark, it's boring. Uh, I like the way it funnels away from me, the way it uh, finds its level, its crevice, it, you know, water falls apart. You know, if you have a high uh, enough waterfall, it's, it's cleansing itself, it's falling apart, gets back together. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I just like the movement. You'll also gain a thorough understanding of painting rocks, the color, and the lost and found edges that make the rocks come alive. Look at that difference. See, I really couldn't um, judge my colors, which are fresh and vibrant like this is, when it was sunken in, as simple as that. You'll be more confident with rocks, whether you're painting them as a center of interest, a strong backdrop, or as a way to direct the water. Albert covers it all here. Uh, overlapping is big. So there's two things I'm pointing out now that I didn't point out before, and that is lost and found edges and overlapping. Albert covers it all here, from toning the canvas all the way to adding final touches. You can paint right along with him as he explains his decisions and methods, which have resulted in the signature look that has brought him recognition and respect throughout the decades. Well, I hope I inspire my students that they want to study with me because they looked at my paintings and they say, God, that's good, that's beautiful, I'd like to learn that. Available on DVD or digital to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order your copy of Painting Water and Rocks in Oil with Albert Handel today. Thank you.